What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com, your home for the still champs 2020 World Series champion Los Angeles Dodgers. Joined tonight by Matt Moreno. Matt, we got a couple more days left where we can say still champs, so we've got to enjoy this while we can, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know there are rumors of baseball still being played. I'm not sure. Kind of check. Yeah. I kind of checked out. I know you definitely have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one team, one team's got like a racist thing maybe going on, and the other team's the Astros. So it's like it just it's easy to uh, it's easy to tune out. We're here for the off season. We're here yeah. for ready to talk Dodgers free agency primer, and that's our plan for tonight. We're going to start with a cap situation breakdown. Where do the Dodgers stand financially? We'll talk about the lockout and how that might impact if there were to be a lockout, how that might impact these things. But then the meat of our time tonight is going to be focused on five people that you're all very familiar with. Clayton Kershaw, Max Scherzer, Corey Seager, Chris Taylor, and Kenley Jansen. And basically a question of what is their resume as free agents? How might the Dodgers approach these things? We'll close it all out by answering a couple questions and then doing some rapid fire stuff of who do we think the Dodgers will actually end the offseason with still on their team. Of course, this is just going to be focused on the guys who are free agents from the Dodgers. We will spend future time talking about potential guys they go out and get. But Matt, let me start with like a brief overview of the Dodgers luxury tax situation. Uh, we'd like to think that the Dodgers have unlimited payroll. If you talk to <laughs> Dodger haters out there, they would tell you that the Dodgers just buy things and you know, look, I don't think they're accurate. I think the Dodgers farm system player development deserves a lot of credit. But to be fair, the Dodgers payroll last year was $253 million, which was $43 million over the first tier of luxury tax. The luxury tax last year began at $210 million. If the Dodgers were to let all five of the guys we are about to talk about walk and not re-sign anybody, not sign any new free agents, their luxury tax payroll is estimated right now to be at $203 million. So just $7 million under the first tier of luxury tax. Now, one thing to note, the Dodgers did sort of reset their luxury tax bill in 2020. So there is a chance that they could continue to go over and the penalties aren't crazy. But as of today, $203 million. The elephant in the room is Trevor Bauer. If he were suspended, his money would come off of the luxury tax bill is what has been reported. That would mean $35 million and change would come off. We're down to about $170 with $40 million to play with before you get to luxury tax. Of course, we don't know. He's on paid administrative leave. He's on the commissioner's list right now. There's rumors of a suspension coming. We're not entirely sure about that. So then the other question is, besides Bauer, can the Dodgers make some room? Well, David Price is the big accounting note on there he is due 32 million dollars against the cap although it's worth noting the Red Sox are paying half of that so only 16 million of his salary is on there um, there are reports that the Dodgers are going to buy out Joe Kelly and pay him four million dollars making him a free agent that would save them eight million dollars total off of their cap he would they have a choice basically to pay him four million to go away or 12 million to stay reports again from Jorge Castillo the LA Times is that they will pay him the four million dollars the other name there is Scott Alexander. He's due to make $1.3 million in the final year of arbitration. That's a fan graphs estimate. They could free that up. And so, Matt, when you look at the cap space, and we'll get to 2023 here in a moment, how do you perceive the Dodgers might move forward? Obviously, they've got a bad taste in their mouth from last season. Is this another year where you just blow past the luxury tax and try and win another World Series? I think so. I mean, I think just by sheer need of, uh, having to fill out the rest of your roster, like you're almost guaranteed to exceed the luxury tax. I'm not necessarily sure at, you know, to what percent they'll go yeah. over it. Uh, and obviously, you know, we can make educated, which we're going to do. We can make educated guesses and kind of try to figure out the math and all that. But really, if there's a lockout or not, even if there's a lockout, there's going to be a new CBA in place yeah. beginning next season. So who knows what kind of the luxury tax threshold or thresholds, will be and what the penalties will then be. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the Dodgers are comfortable kind of exceeding it in back-to-back -back seasons. I think what they've really tried to avoid because the penalties get pretty drastic in terms of, you know, draft picks and stuff like that is going over it three years in a row. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, even, you know, re-signing just one or two of their 11 free agents, like it could push them basically right up to the line. And that's without, you know, whatever possible trades they might make during yeah. the middle of next season and all that. Yeah, and once you're going to go over, your number goes up, but you've kind of checked the box for 2022 over the luxury tax, at which point, hey, full send, you might as well do it. 
I will say, I think one thing working in the Dodgers' favor as far as this offseason goes is they do have another wave of really legit prospects coming up, but none of them are going to be ready for next year. So if you're mapping out long-term, when is the year that you might need to spend in order to bridge the gap? This is the year. A year from now, you're hoping guys like Ryan Pepio and Bobby Miller and Landon Knack, those types of pitchers, can maybe plug some holes in the rotation, plug some holes in the bullpen. Guys like Michael Bush and Cody Hosey and um, you know some of those types of players, Miguel Vargas, Mike, Andy Pajes, those guys might be able to uh, augment the offense a little bit with, yeah. you know, if we're being honest, unfairly low salaries for themselves. One other note about the salaries, looking ahead to 2023, David Price comes off for good. So that's a big chunk of change that comes off there. Trevor Bauer still would be on there for $35.33 million, depending on what he does. Um, I think we are both in agreement. We don't expect Trevor Bauer ever to pitch for the Dodgers again. So when we talk about his salary, that's simply an accounting number. We're not expecting him to play. Joe Kelly would be off um, under this circumstances. Blake Trinan and Max Muncy both have team options. Those, I think, would get picked up. A.J. Pollock probably opting out of a $10 million player option. Justin Turner, who knows? He's got a $16 million vesting option. So we'll see what that looks like. And then you've got guys like Tommy Canely, Austin Barnes, and Scott Alexander, who would be free agents. Of course, in 2023, you've got a decision to make with Trey Turner, as he is currently entering his final year of arbitration due to make around $20 million this year. You've also got to consider some guys who are entering arbitration. So Walker Bueller's arbitration number will go up. Julio's arbitration will go up. And then Will Smith, Dustin May, Bruce Dark Gratterall will all be entering arbitration for the first time. So some good news long-term, at least the, you know, the price contract, I think is the, the sort of the one albatross that will be coming yeah. off. Um, the other note that, that is sort of hovering over the top of all of this is a collective bargaining agreement that expires at 1159 PM Eastern on December 1st. Um, that gives us about a three ish week window for free agency. Free agency begins five days after the world series. So we got about three weeks before December 1st, where there will be free agency, but all these people will be signing contracts not really knowing into what sort of a league they are signing those contracts. Um, reading up on kind of where we're at, The Athletic had this to say, as far as the core economics go, quote, the piece, the piece both sides are most concerned with, the gap is large. The league and the union have made one such proposal each. Neither was well received by the other. Uh, the union, they say, is focused on incentivizing competition and getting player, players paid more early in their careers, whereas the owners are trying to expand the playoff system to great new revenue. There's pitch clocks, universal DH, etc. will all be in there. 26 years of labor peace at risk. The last lockout, 1994-1995. So on that note, Matt, with the lockout, how do you see that playing out? I think you've mentioned before Andrew Friedman has kind of addressed the elephant in the room. How, did, how does he think that might impact free agency from a Dodger perspective? Yeah, I mean, he's, you know, Friedman at his uh, press conference after the season ended, he basically said the Dodgers are prepared and willing to operate sort of however is necessary. And if one of their free agents or I guess, you know, any free agent kind of across the league is willing to come to them and say, hey, I'm willing to sign. I want to sign. Let's get something done before the current CBA expires. Friedman made it clear the Dodgers would absolutely uh, engage in those conversations and see where they go and try to get something done. Conversely, with uh, when he was speaking primarily about Dodger players who are going to become free agents, he said if they want to wait and see what the market's going to bear for them, either for the three weeks with the current CBA or after a new one is in place, the Dodgers 100% will respect that. And that's really consistent with a message he has said every single year with whatever player or players are reaching free agency. He said, you know, they, he views that as they've worked to get to that point. Obviously, you have to accrue service time and get go through that in arbitration process. Uh, so he never wants to necessarily take that uh, experience or opportunity away from them. Um, so he's, he's honestly prepared for either scenario. And I, me personally, you know, I think we'll see a little bit of both. I think you'll see some players who say, Hey, you know, let's get something done right now. And you'll see some who want to wait and see what the new CBA will be like and what, how aggressive teams may be. Uh, of course, the trade-off to that is it could backfire if, for whatever reason, it's a unfavorable uh, terms for the team. Yeah, it, it's interesting because when I look at the list of guys that the Dodgers have up personally, Clayton Kershaw, Max Scherzer, Kenley Jansen, Corey Seager, you know, those four specifically have all made a bunch of money. Yes, this is Corey Seager's first contract, but he has been paid handsomely as a, as a former Rookie of the Year, a guy who has done fairly well in the arbitration numbers. So those aren't guys that are like, you know, living paycheck to paycheck and need the signing bonus come December 1st. Otherwise, it's going to be a rough six months for them. Chris Taylor, obviously, I mean, he he's doing okay for himself. He maybe hasn't 
cashed in on the contracts like Scherzer and Kershaw and Jansen have, all of whom who have signed massive contracts at least once, sometimes twice in those guys' case. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out because if all those guys are wanting to wait and say, hey, well, let's just see how this shakes out. We're not in a rush. We're comfortable financially. Does that put the Dodgers in a tough situation? If other guys, maybe backup plans at some of those positions actually are like, no, I actually do need the cash. I do need to, to get a signing bonus. I'd like to put some security in my life. So an interesting storyline, I think, to navigate. Obviously, it's going to be on the front pages as soon as the season ends is this collective bargaining agreement. I mean, again, December 1st, here we are on November 1st, one month from today, we might be in a lockout situation. So to be yeah. determined there, but let's dive into sort of what people are here to talk about, which is Clayton Kershaw, Max Scherzer, Kenley Jansen, Corey Seager, and Chris Taylor, and whether or not these guys will be Dodgers next season, no particular order, but let's start with the man, the myth, the legend himself, Clayton Kershaw, um, a Dodger legend entering his age 34 season, coming off of a year that was not his best to say the least a 3.55 ERA. He makes just 22 starts. He came off a great, um, you know, his FIP was good, excuse me, 3.00, the strikeout rate, the highest it was since 2017. But if we're talking about elephants in the room with Clayton Kershaw, it's the biggest one. He's got an elbow issue right now as we speak, forearm issue, excuse me, sort of both, I guess. Those two things are connected. <laughs> he hasn't made 30 starts since all the way back in 2015. And there's a lot of concern here. I mean, I think we would both agree, Matt, that Kershaw, when he's pitching and at full strength, is still very, very good. Not, you know, best pitcher in the league, but I still think in the top 20, you know, if he's your number three starter, you've got the best number three starter yeah. in baseball. The concern is he's 34, which, by the way, he's 34, okay? We're going to talk about a guy in a moment who's 37, 38, excuse me, and about to sign a contract worth 35-plus million a year. So 34 is not old, and yet we know the velocity's down, and now we're dealing with a forearm, elbow injury, I think everybody's thinking in the back of their heads is Tommy John and Clayton Kershaw's future. If you were Andrew Friedman, Matt, how would you approach Clayton Kershaw? Is this a no-brainer, full steam ahead, whatever it takes, sign him, or do you have some caution? I mean, I think you need to have a little bit of caution. That being said, I, will, I guess I'll preface everything by saying Andrew Friedman did say himself that, you know, taking off the, his hat as president of baseball operations, he definitely loves the possibility for the nostalgic aspect of Clayton Kershaw spending his entire career with the Dodgers. Yeah. Uh, I think the Dodgers recognize his importance to the team, the clubhouse, the community, uh, and they will make every earnest effort to re-sign him. And I think that will be reciprocated. I think Kershaw is comfortable here. Yeah. I think he wants to play for a team that is competing for championships. You know, I know we'll probably touch on the Rangers as a possible destination, but they're, they're not in that picture. The only thing yeah. they could kind of offer him is being close to his Dallas home. Uh, you know how much that will, how much weight that'll end up carrying. If, if they only they had ways to get from Los Angeles to Dallas, you know, yeah. if, if only there was like <laughs> high speed travel that existed to make yeah. that not too bad of a thing, you know. Right. Uh, so I think for me, you know, just the big question is, even for maybe Kershaw, I'm not necessarily, you know, I think he wants he'll make every effort to continue playing. Yeah. But one thing he did say when an LDS began and he met with uh, some reporters at Oracle park and he mentioned needing to give his, and he keeps saying his injury is just the flexor tendon and it's not the UCL. He's been consistent with that. So taking that for what it's worth, he says he just needs to give it time to heal and that he didn't do that during the season. Obviously the first attempt he, he admitted to rushing back. Yeah. I think the second time now in retrospect, that was probably rushed a little bit, but he wanted to get back to the playoffs. And I think that's commendable. Uh, but what's to say, you know, if December comes comes around and he starts throwing for the first time, if there is more pain, yeah, you know that that could then change his calculus because then at that point maybe does he need Tommy John surgery? And if you're Clayton Kershaw, do you want to lose the entire 2022 right. season while recovering? So that is kind of a delicate balance with I think the con you know potential contract negotiations that him and the Dodgers will have. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. I mean, the, the image that I can't get out of my head is when he left that game October 1st, so one month ago today against Milwaukee, he goes one and two thirds, allows five hits, three earned runs, no walks, just one strikeout. That's at home in Dodger Stadium. I just, as soon as that happened, I said, this isn't how it ends. It's not possible that Clayton Kershaw feels comfortable letting this be the final chapter of his story with the Dodgers. And so I'm with you. I think that the, the forearm elbow stuff is worrisome. It's good to hear that he has been consistent. He doesn't seem like the type that is going to lie. Um, 
And yet there is some concern there. But I guess what I would say is he's only 34. So like, as crazy as it sounds, even if worst case scenario, he has to get Tommy John. Now, you don't want to be paying a guy 20 million bucks a year while he's not pitching for you getting Tommy John. But I, I would be comfortable with the idea of like, even if he were to get Tommy John and have to come back a year and a half from now, that I don't think his career is over then. I still think he's a good enough pitcher, even without the velocity. I think he's got the curveball. He's got the slider. He's able to mix some stuff up, but he's still a good enough pitcher to be very, very good. And so then the question becomes compensation. Um, I was looking for comps for each of these guys, and some of them are a lot harder to find than others. One guy that I thought was an interesting comp as far as an annual value, an AAV, for Kershaw was actually someone that all Dodger fans are pretty familiar with, which was Hyunjin Ryu. He was heading into his age 33 season when he was a free agent, so one year younger than Kershaw. He was coming off a really good 2019, the best of his career, so that's maybe where there's a little bit difference. But Ryu got $20 million a year for a four-year contract. Now, you and I don't think Clayton Kershaw at age 34 is going to be signing a four-year contract, but I do wonder if that $20 million number is interesting. He's not as good as Ryu was when he signed that, but he's also Clayton Kershaw, future Hall of Famer. He's got some leverage just because of the name brand that comes with him. And so I wonder if a contract for Kershaw might land somewhere in the two years for $40 million range. Now, one other thing we've mentioned previously in conversations is this idea of maybe it's a heavily incentive-laden deal. Maybe it's a team option for the third year to give the team a little bit of a break on the luxury tax. So maybe it's something more like three for $60 million a year, but the final year is like a $15 million team option, and the first two years are actually like, you know, a $15 million base salary, but then massive incentives if he gets to 20 starts or something like that. So I guess the simplified way is I see this being a two to three year deal, something in the range of $20 million a year. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's definitely fair. I would just, part of me want, you know, the incentives are, it makes sense, especially like we just touched on with some of the injury concerns. I just don't know how heavy they might do that because those can, in my opinion, can kind of be perceived as a little bit of a slight and an insult to the player, right? Yeah. Like, hey, you know, we want to sign you, but we have injury concerns, so you need yeah. to make X amount of starts to get this. I don't know if they would do that to Kershaw. Yeah. It's a fair point. It's a fair point. And at the end of the show, by the way, we will break down some of these specific numbers and say, okay, you threw this out for Clayton Kershaw. Are you actually interested in signing that contract? But let's move from one starting pitcher to another. Of course, if you follow the Dodgers, if you're watching this show, you know that starting pitching is a minor need for the Dodgers. They have Walker Bueller and Julio Urias under contract. And after that, it's a whole bunch of Afterwards, we got Tony Gonsolin, potentially healthy. Obviously, Dustin May is out for at least half, maybe all of next season. You've got young guys like Mitch White and Andre Jackson. Ryan Pepio, another guy who has been mentioned by Andrew Friedman, is somebody who could be in the mix there. Um, David Price, who knows what his status is for next season. Um, But Max Scherzer is the other name. Max Scherzer, of course, came over in a trade midway through the year, pitched maybe one of the best 10 to 11 start stretches I've ever seen from any pitcher, an ERA under two absolutely dominant um he's coming off a really good season for himself he actually set a career best era 2.46 era he made 30 starts he has done he has made 30 starts every year of his career except for 2019 and the shortened 2020 so an unbelievable durability guy compared to kershaw who we just talked about the strikeout rate was down a little bit the walk rate though was one of the best marks of his career lots of numbers i've seen for him i've seen Three for 100 is kind of a benchmark. I don't know if the Dodgers would want to go three. I wonder if it would be closer to the two for 72-ish range. But before we get into numbers, Matt, Max Scherzer, how does he fit on this Dodgers team in your estimation? I mean, he's definitely somebody that they could obviously – I mean, he's somebody they need. I mean, there's no getting – like you just said, they're starting pitching. You know, it's – maybe they have uh, numbers in terms of, hey, seven potential starters. They got bodies they can throw out there. Right. Like you just said, you know, it's inexperience. And so who, you, that's not what a uh, World Series contender yeah. would do. Yeah. I think, you know, you touched on it earlier with the Bauer situation. Frankly, I think Scherzer's potential future with the team is more or less directly tied to the Trevor Bauer investigation. And until that is sort of resolved, I don't know how aggressive the Dodgers will really be in trying to sign. Scher- I mean, look, well, they might come to him and say, we can pay you. 60 million for one year you know something crazy like that right i don't know if he'd take it i think scherzer wants to win he was he's been pretty open about that you know at the trade deadline he had a full no trade clause and every team that was linked to him was pretty much a world series contender at the time 
And then there was also the Padres in the picture. <laughs> yeah. Non, uh, in the non-World Series competitor co- uh, class. Right. <laughs> so I think he values winning. He's obviously signed lucrative contracts uh, already. That's not to say that he yeah. will absolutely pass up on dollars this time or that he needs to because, really, you know, there's money in the sport yeah. across the – no matter what teams uh, try to claim. But, yeah, I mean, his, his – situ- re- I think the path to the Dodgers re-signing him is not – clear at all yeah i think it's an interesting one because the idea that they would pay scherzer 35 to 40 million dollars while also having to pay and and take the luxury tax bill for trevor bowers 35 million dollars is tough to stomach and obviously the acquisition of scherzer was directly tied to the absence of bauer although they did have to pay both of those guys last season it's hard to imagine them saying yes we're going to resign kershaw yes we're going to resign scherzer and oh by the way we still have to fit the foot, foot the luxury tax bill for a guy like Trevor Bauer. So interesting there. You mentioned, I mean, the Dodgers, we know, the reason that I'm optimistic about a Scherzer reunion is because he is looking for the type of contract that I think Andrew Friedman loves to give out, which is high dollars but short years. And so a guy like Scherzer, if you can give him one year for $40 million, if you can give him two years for $70 million, and maybe say, we're going to give you a higher annual value to a guy who says he wants to pitch into his 40s, by the way, entering his age 38 season, that could be interesting. Um, so who knows? We'll see if if that's the offer that is made. Again, we know the Dodgers are interested. I've heard rumors that the Nationals, it could be like the Araldis Chapman thing where the Yankees trade him away yeah. and then immediately <laughs> re-sign him afterwards. That could be the thing. But we also know Scherzer said, hey, I want to go somewhere where it's warm. And he wanted to go to the West Coast. And so he pitched great as a member of the Dodgers. Um, so maybe he likes Dodger Stadium. Maybe he likes the warm weather. I think it's worth noting also the same kind of idea with Kershaw. Like Scherzer is a competitor. And he seems like a guy of, of honor and loyalty kind of thing. So I wonder if there's a part of him like, hey, you know what? I actually didn't give this team my best. When, when it mattered most, I wasn't necessarily ready. Now, look, whose fault was that? Like, he was asked to throw in relief. He wanted to throw in relief. So I, I don't know. That might be a minor thing that doesn't even register. But I wonder if he feels a sense of like, hey, we have unfinished business here. And I couldn't pitch in game six. And we lost that one. And so you know, on we go. Now, the, the counter to that is why didn't he pitch in game six? Because he's going into his age 38 season. He had dead arm after being asked to do anything. Any injury concerns with you with Scherzer? I mentioned it. Makes 30 starts every single season of his career, except for 2019, if we wipe out the short in 2020 where it wasn't even possible. Now he's got dead arm. He misses a start in the playoffs. Is that any long-term concern for you, Matt? Not too much. I mean, I think it's, it, it would only enter, it only enters my mind a little bit because of uh, the I think it was a triceps injury he had right right before the trade deadline, but that just he was just scratched from the one start, came right back, did his final audition, was healthy and was healthy throughout the rest of the year until, like you said, he his usage I think just sort of skyrocketed and I think if anything you know the Dodgers just sort of learned like we probably just can't really do that and I don't want to belabor the point but I have been on here. And I firmly believe that once he was used in game five of the NLDS, you should have just saved him until game three of the NLCS because it wasn't the World Series and you were still going to have to possibly play another round if you had, you know, if you're hoping to advance. So why are you going to try to burn him out? But, you know, water under the bridge. Yeah, no, I mean, it is a great point. It's not an argument I've heard made outside of the, the conversations we've had. And I think it's a good point. And so who knows? We'll see. Well, hopefully that wasn't the last thing we remember of Max Scherzer's time as a Dodger. But let's go to free agent number three, probably the most interesting, I would say, of the bunch. And that is one, Corey Seager. Corey Seager turns 28 in April. um, And he's one of the best shortstops in baseball. Although, unfortunately for him, he's entering the free agent market at a time where a number of the other best shortstops in baseball are entering. If you're looking for a benchmark, Francisco Lindor, who is five months older than Corey Seager, recently signed a contract 10 years, $340 million. Of course, Lindor got traded to the Mets. There was a little bit of leverage that he had over the Mets. Mets new ownership. So I'm not sure if 10, 340 is the baseline for a Seager conversation, but it's definitely where Scott Boris is going to want to start things out, whether or not it stays there. Uh, Worth noting, as far as Seager versus Lindor, over the last three seasons, Lindor has accumulated 9.2 wins above replacement to Seager's 8.8. If you go three seasons before that, Lindor... 18.9 18.9 versus Seager, 13.4. From, from a straight wins above replacement perspective, Lindor at 10.340 has actually been a better player. But the asterisk here and the caveat, and again, the thing that, that hovers over everything around Corey Seager is health. 
part of the reason for the numbers I just gave you. He played just 26 games in 2018. He played 134 in 2019. 2020, probably one of the more healthy seasons of his career. He missed just eight games. And when I say miss, some of those were probably normal rest. But then in 2021, he plays just 95 games. And so health is going to be a concern for Corey Seager. Now, we're going to play a little game here, Matt. And I'm going to throw four mystery players up on the board. But I'll let everybody at home in on a slight (laughs) secret, which is me, Matt, and Daniel actually recorded this episode earlier today. And my computer crashed, and we lost the entirety of the show. And so, unfortunately, you all watching this aren't going to get a surprise on Matt's face when he learns who all of these people are. But let me throw four mystery players here. These are all players capable of playing shortstop. And I want you, as, a, as somebody watching, just look at this list and tell me how you would navigate. So we'll start with player A. Over the last three seasons, okay, 19, 20, and 21, player A has hit 70 home runs. They've got an OPS of 864, a weighted runs created plus of 113. That's a number where 100 is a league average offensive player. So this person is 13% better than average. They've got a hard hit percentage of 43.8, a barrel percentage of 8.8, average exit velocity of 90.7, the best of any of the marks there. The last two categories are defensive metrics, defensive run saved, 36, UZR, ultimate zone rating, basically how many runs um, above average per 150 defensive games played. So positive numbers there, 5.9. As I joked, you don't have to actually know what UZR over 150 means other than to say this person is the best defensive player of the four compared here. Okay, so positive numbers on those last two are good. Negative numbers are bad. Player no- player B here, kind of a- an interesting middle ground, less home runs, lower OPS, but a higher weighted runs created plus. Um, hard hit, barrel percentage, exit velocity, all in the mix. Another really good defensive option there. Then we get to player C, 50 home runs, the lowest of the bunch, but a really good OPS, a really good weighted runs created. Plus, again, those stat cast numbers all in the same. But now we've got a below average, maybe even a highly below average player defensively at shortstop. Finally, you've got player D, 59 home runs, but then we've got the highest OPS, the highest weighted runs created plus, um, and then right in the middle there, stat cast, and kind of a league average defensive player there and so we did this exercise earlier and I said okay who do you think all these players are and we joked about how well player a you like the offense combined with the defense man I hope that's not Carlos Correa we are guessing about whether or not Corey Seager where is he in this group I think Daniel and Matt had him either b c or d and so here's here's the the big reveal player a is Trevor Story Player B is Carlos Correa. Player C is Corey Seager. And player D was my trick inclusion here, which is Trey Turner, not a free agent, but a guy that the Dodgers are going to be navigating. So Matt, from your perspective, when you found out that player A is Trevor Story, B is Correa, C is Seager, and D is Trey Turner, what was your initial reaction and sort of response to that? At first, I was shocked that Trevor Story was column A. I thought, I think Daniel and I were both pretty convinced that it was going to be Carlos Correa just because, you know, you hear about him being so strong offensively and in the field as well. Uh, So that was surprising. Then for, you know, for me personally, I was shocked to see Corey Seager kind of rated so low with some of the advanced stats, mainly the eight, the negative 8.7. I mean, I know that there have been questions about his defense. I think it's not as bad as people have made it out to be. I think, yes, he does need to move to third base and probably will eventually. Uh, And then, frankly, to see Trey Turner also rated that lowly, you know, zero defensive run save, because all you sort of hear is that he is a great shortstop, right, defensively. And so that those were kind of the most surprising things. I I, I love exercises like this because as much as we all despise Carlos Correa, it kind of like takes away our bias and Trevor Story and whatever you think about him and and how much we love Corey Seager. Maybe it brings some reality there. But it also highlights some of the things that are true. So Story for me is funny because the way that runs created plus number is interesting. Obviously, that that shows you the Coors Field effect. Here's a guy whose OPS is actually higher than Carlos Correa. He has more home runs than Carlos Correa, and yet he is 16% worse offensively because of the Coors Field effect. But yeah, I was with you. I was surprised with how good he was defensively. But then also, I think it was confirmation of, the, of how good Corey Seager is offensively. He's got an OPS that's really high. He's got one of the best way to run created plus. Um, and, and I knew he was not great defensively. As you said, I was surprised a little bit that Trey Turner wasn't higher because we hear of how much better he is defensively at shortstop than Corey Seager. But I think Trey Turner's offensive numbers are what jump out to me. 
if you would have told me that Trey Turner's OPS over the last three seasons is 24 points higher than Corey Seager, he's got a higher weighted runs created plus, he's got almost 10 more home runs, and oh, by the way, about 1,000 more stolen bases than all four guys on this list. I think it just speaks to how good Trey Turner is, which leads me to the obvious question, which is, do the Dodgers have to choose, in your mind, between Corey Seager and Trey Turner? Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, if you were to see them re-sign Corey Seager this winter, you know, do they then look into trading Trey Turner next year at some point? Uh, that would be kind of an interesting wrinkle for the Dodgers. Because usually yeah. they're the team sort of preying on the rentals, you know, the big marquee rentals who become available at the trade deadline. But I don't. I wouldn't see a scenario where they sign Seager to the type of contract we're expecting, possibly re-signing Kershaw, possibly re-signing Scherzer, and then turning around yeah. and doing the same thing with Trey Turner. Like, it's yeah, just, like, it's it's, just not feasible for them. And it's an interesting point that I think is needs to be mentioned, which is the Dodgers uniquely are in a lever position of leverage, a position of authority in their conversations with Corey Seager. Normally, when a team's best player becomes a free agent and they get all the way to free agency, now the team is screwed because it's like you have let the cat out of the bag. Now you're now negotiating against 30 other real offers, you know, whatever it might be. But for the Dodgers, it's fascinating because Correa is a free agent. Story's a free agent. Marcus Semien's a free agent. Javi Baez is a free agent. Trey Turner is one year away and already in the building. And so you've got five guys basically who are going to be commanding big dollar numbers at shortstop at the exact same position. And there aren't five teams out there, I think, that are going to be comfortable paying $35 million a year for a guy to play shortstop or, in Seager's case, maybe third base, which we can talk about. And also, on top of that, the Dodgers can negotiate with Seager from a position of, hey, look, here's our offer. You want to be in L.A. We'd like to have you in L.A. But at the end of the day, we don't need to overpay for you because we've got a guy that you could make a really simple argument who is actually better than you, who's far more durable than you. Yes, he's a couple years older but who's better and more durable, and he's already here, and he's here for another year, so we don't even have to do anything today. I've said from the get-go, if I were Andrew Friedman, I would call Trey Turner into my office, and I would say, Trey, here's the offer that we're willing to make to you. We'll offer you an eight-year extension worth $260 million if you want to take it. And if you say no, we're going to call Corey Seager in, and we're going to make him the same offer. We're going to make one of you guys the same deal. We're going to pay one of you guys an exorbitant amount of money and – Whichever one takes it, you feel good. If it's Seager long-term, great. And if you have one year with both of them, awesome. If it's Trey Turner and Seager walks and you get the first-round pick from the uh, um, you know sort of qualifying offer that, that he doesn't accept, then great too. So that's how I would play it. But overall, I think it's interesting the position of leverage that the Dodgers have with those two. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we knew, obviously, you know, that, that was kind of at the forefront of people's minds. Well, first was, yeah. you know, who's going to play where when they made the trade for Max Scherzer and Trey Turner. And then it was like, well, wait a minute. You know, this could get really interesting within the next year plus because Seager will obviously be a free agent now. And Trey Turner, uh, in some sense, maybe, obviously, it's not necessarily something Andrew Friedman could admit publicly. But maybe they got some sort of idea that Seager is prob probably leaning towards leaving or at least they're, the Dodgers aren't going to extend themselves to the type of contract that would uh, be required that he might command. Uh, I know you and Daniel, we have another video up on our channel that Seager yep. reportedly turned down a uh, contract extension during the season. Uh, so yeah, you know, it's, the, the Dodgers yeah. could be in a worse position. Obviously you never want to lose a talent yeah, like Seager, but the Dodgers it could be worse. Play devil's advocate. The worst case for the Dodgers would be to let Seager walk and then to lose Trey Turner a year from now when they don't have any leverage, when Trey Turner is going yeah. to be the prize of the entire free agency market in a non-loaded class. And so Andrew Friedman's got some negotiating to do there. Let's touch on the positional thing. Jorge Luis submitted this question. If the Dodgers offer Corey a contract, obviously his move to third base down the line is something they're thinking about. Do they still offer him, quote, shortstop money? I'll answer the first part very easily. Yes, Corey Seager is going to get paid like a shortstop, whether he continues to play shortstop or not. We've joked that he might be comfortable moving to third base once he signs this big contract. He might have just wanted to say, no, I'm a shortstop because I need to get paid like a shortstop. The bigger question for you, Matt, is do you trust Corey Seager long-term as a shortstop? Because that's the thing. If you're deciding between Trey Turner and Corey Seager, there's belief that Trey Turner can stay at shortstop long-term because of his athleticism. Seager's height, Seager's injury history have some more concerns there. So yes, he's going to get paid shortstop money. Is he going to be getting paid shortstop money to pay to play third base? 
I think so, but I still think that a potential move to third base is, okay. at, you know, like two or three years away. I think he can continue to play shortstop definitely next season, probably one more season after that. Then I think it would get maybe a little bit dicey. And some of that is, you know, I think as much as I, I believe that his defensive struggles, I guess, if you will, is, are a little bit overblown. Yeah. The fact of the matter is he's a big guy to be playing shortstop and he already does, you know, he's already had a hip surgery. He had some minor back trouble. He's had some hamstring issues. So, you know, it's not difficult to see why uh, he would have to come off shortstop at some point, but I don't think he's going to, I don't see a scenario where he signs a contract, big contract this, this off season. And then okay. next year, yeah, is yeah, I, agree with you. I think his long-term is third base. As I said, I think once he signs this next contract, my hope is that he stops caring so much about what position he plays. Third base would be better for him health-wise. It would help him offensively at the plate, I think. So I, I don't know why there would be any stubbornness at that point. Last question on this front. If they don't sign Seager and they don't extend Trey Turner, do you think there is any chance that Correa, Story, Semyon, a guy who they reportedly made a run at a year ago, or Baez, if any of the four of those guys could be brought in to replace Seager if Seager goes elsewhere? I don't think so. I mean, I definitely don't see Carlos Correa. Uh, I think Andrew Friedman, you know, he gets his, the perception yeah. is that all he cares about is, you know, letting a computer sort of dictate everything. <laughs> he does understand the human element. He knows better yeah. than to bring a member of the 2017 Astros into this clubhouse. Uh, so Correa, you can pretty much eliminate. And if I'm wrong, then I will, you'll have to have him back on and I'll have to yeah. say, man, I really blew that one. You won't be alone. One. You won't be alone uh, in that one. But really, I don't, <laughs> I don't see I don't see a scenario if it's if the Dodgers don't re-sign Seager then I don't see them going and bringing in another marquee shortstop because you will no matter what you have at least another year of Trey Turner and then if you have already lost Corey Seager to free agency then you know a year from now hey we need to just be really aggressive with Trey Turner yeah, to make sure we keep one. him with it's the a fair team one. and the other guy who I think is related to the Corey Seager conversation moving along is J Chris Taylor and Chris Taylor is number four on this list mm -hmm. of guys that the Dodgers could potentially sign he's a guy who just turned thirty one. MajorLeagueBaseball.com's got their top 25 free agents. Chris Taylor is number 22 on that list. Just to put some numbers in context, over the last three seasons for him, he's got 40 home runs, an OPS just under 800, a weighted runs created plus of 114. So that's tied with Trevor Story. He's an interesting one because, you know, I think there, there's a number of things. First of all, I think Taylor is unique in that I, I genuinely don't think he cares about being a utility guy. I think you saw a guy like Kike Hernandez who really wanted to play one position and to play it every single day. I think there's a part of Chris Taylor that says, as long as I'm playing every day, I don't really care. If you want me in left field one day, center field the next, second base the next, shortstop after that, and then third base, then fine, so be it, I'll do it. So I think that is a pro Dodgers thing in his favor. Um, I don't think he cares about all this other noise. I think he likes being in LA. He seems like a fairly simple guy. And so I think Andrew Friedman both has a high value of him, and I think he wants to be there. And the last piece that I think works in favor of a Dodgers-Taylor reunion is I think when they let Kike walk, there was a sense of, oh, well, we can replace him. We've got Zach McKinstry. Well, McKinstry didn't really work out. He hit really, really well before getting hurt. But defensively, he was a mess everywhere he played. Kike was great. Chris Taylor is great. And so he's an interesting one. And, and I say that because when I ask you, do the Dodgers go after any of these other high-priced shortstops, I've basically got it pretty penciled down in my head that if Corey Seager is gone, Chris Taylor is definitely being re-signed. Now, could they sign both of them? Maybe. I just don't see a scenario where they don't get either of these two guys. Yeah, that's definitely fair to say. And I know, you know, the organization is high on Chris Taylor. Dave Roberts called him the MVP, the team's MVP this year. Uh, he's constantly praised his work ethic, his willingness, like you said, to just play any position. It doesn't matter. Uh, and Chris Taylor, I forgot at what point of the season it was this year, but he he did give an interview where he said, look, like, the utility role doesn't bother me because, like you explained, he is pretty much playing every day. And he he recognizes that. And he also values being part of a team that is in uh, that is a World Series contender year in and year out. And, you know, after the Dodgers were eliminated in the NLCS, Chris Taylor said he's loved every minute of being with the Dodgers. So I would be shocked if he isn't re-signed. I mean, I guess the only... The only way I see it maybe not happening is if, like you said, the Dodgers end up with Corey Seager and maybe some other team comes along and just gives Chris Taylor an offer that, A, he can't refuse, and B, the Dodgers just can't match for whatever reason. Yeah. I don't see the two of those things happening. Uh, and it, it just seems like both the Dodgers and Chris Taylor, they both need each yeah. other. It just seems like a perfect fit. Everybody's ha happy. 
like you said, he kind of flies under the radar. This team has a bunch of stars, so Chris Taylor can quietly sort of produce and not necessarily get the headlines of a Cody Bellinger, yeah. a Walker Bueller, Clayton Kershaw, Justin Turner, all those guys. Yeah, and it's interesting because obviously him marketing himself as a shortstop is where the most money would come for him in free agency. But as we said, he's like the sixth or seventh best shortstop that's going to be a free agent. Obviously, there's a lot of teams out there with smart GMs who love the positional versatility. So the question then is, is dollar amount. So the best comp I could come up with, and this isn't so much a comp of these two players are equal, but more of like a range of dollar amounts, was DJ LeMahieu. DJ LeMahieu was a much better player entering free agency. He was also a year and a half older than Chris Taylor was. He only got $15 million a year. That was a six-year, $90 million contract that he signed. And again, LeMahieu had much better numbers than Taylor did. And so for me, I think that 15 to $16 million range is right in the sweet spot. I could see him signing a three or four year contract. He did just turn 31, but I look at the way he plays and it feels like something that can hold up off over time. So I would have no issue offering Chris Taylor like a four year, $64 million contract, something like that. Now, but you have to settle an argument here because when I said that out loud to Daniel, Daniel thinks Chris Taylor is going to get north of $20 million in annual value, which to <laughs> me is crazy. To me, that's crazy. I said Taylor and Kenley Jansen, who we're going to talk about in a moment, are in the same ballpark. Do you think he's closer to 15 or closer to 20 when all is said and done? I mean, I guess I'll, I'll sort of, no, if I had to pick, on. I would say definitely, I would say, well, closer, definitely closer to 15, but it wouldn't shock me if uh, it's like really 15 to 18 okay. type thing. I don't, I don't see it getting to 20 or definitely not above. That being said, sometimes all it takes is one yeah. team to come in and say, Hey, we want to, we're going to give you this. And then, you know, you and I are sitting here saying, well, I guess Daniel, you were yeah. right. Um, but yeah, I could I could see fifteen to eighteen million for him, and I think about probably three or four years. It sounds about right, and I think that's something that the Dodgers would be comfortable yeah. with. Yeah. Okay. The last guy on this list, Kenley Jansen, just turned thirty four. He just posted his best ERA since two thousand seventeen. That was two point two two across sixty nine appearances. His his strikeout rate was the lowest since two thousand eighteen. His walk rate was the highest of his career, and yet. The guy was dominant. The guy held up. And I think most importantly, he reinvented himself. I think there were lots of questions over the past few years of what happens when that 95-mile-an-hour cutter becomes a 92-mile-an-hour cutter, when there's not the velocity on top of the movement. And he started to get hit. But this year, he came back, and he said, I'm going to learn how to throw a breaking ball, and I'm going to throw it with conviction, and I'm going to throw it often. And it's not just going to be cutter, 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 cutter. And so the results speak for themselves. He was dominant in the regular season. He was dominant in the postseason as well. But I wonder for Kenley Jansen, and I've said this before, and, and you can disagree with me if you want. Of all the guys on this list, I think if you ask Taylor, if you ask Seeger, and if you ask Kershaw, and some people have, those three would all say, we definitely want to be Los Angeles Dodgers. And I believe them when they say that. Max Scherzer, I don't know. He was only here for a few months. To me, and I might be way off on this. I don't know Kenley Jansen personally, so I'm not pretending to speak like I know him. But I just wonder, I, the, the sense I got from interviews over the past couple of years is the fact that he was booed by Dodger fans seemed to be something he took personally. The fact that Dave Roberts took him out of the closer role in the middle of the postseason last year, he had that moment where he shuts the door on a game and he death stares into the dugout, and yet he <laughs> says, oh, no, 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 I had nothing to do with that. I think there's genuine frustration with some of the things that have happened. I guess to say, Kershaw, it's been a perfect relationship. Seager, perfect relationship. Chris Taylor, perfect relationship. From Kenley Jansen's perspective, I don't feel like he might think it's been a perfect relationship. And so he's actually a guy that I don't think if all money is equal, that he would take a little bit less to play for the Dodgers. I think, I won't say he's eager to get out, but I don't think he'll be bummed if he leaves Los Angeles. Do you agree or disagree? Am I way off? You, you seem like you might have a better pulse on this than me. I, I agree with some of that, some of what you okay. said. I think it's, it's fair, definitely fair to say that the booing and not being the closer in the world's postseason and then the World Series last year, did bother him and frustrated him. But I think that's sort of, I would equate that to being sort of normal for any professional athlete at this yeah. level where, you know, you, you want to be, first of all, you don't want to be booed by your home yeah. fans, right? Like nobody, nobody wants to experience that. And so that could frustrate you. It could upset you. But then I think that is then turned into motivation. And I think we saw some of that with Kenley. Yeah. Uh, and same thing with uh, last year with him, you know, being stripped of his clo unofficially yeah. being stripped of his closer role because Dave Roberts, throughout the playoffs last year, continue to say Kenley is our closer, but then, you know, what? the ninth inning would roll around and Kenley's in the yeah. bullpen. 
uh, or the arm barn, or we're going to start calling it yeah, that now. We want to be, we want to be politically correct to all the animal <laughs> rights activists out there who don't like uh, bull pens. Uh, so, but all of that being said, I think if all things were equal, if the Dodgers didn't necessarily lowball Kenley, I think he would want to resign. He is, he has often said, you know, his focus this year was only on helping the team win another championship. He wasn't worried about free agency. So I think maybe the kind of the, the way you interpret some of his comments could more mainly be attributed to, I think Kenley also recognizes that there's a business aspect sure. to all of this. Frankly, I think he also went into this season. It was at, at least it was my belief. Well, I guess I should be more clear. I think I, I went into this season thinking it was going to be Kenley's last year with the Dodgers. Yeah. He struggled last year. The team obviously went away from him. And so, you know, they were just kind of getting it to the finish yeah. line. My suspicion is Kenley might have had the same sort of feelings, but then he honestly went out and I think pitched his way into the Dodgers reevaluating that stance. Yeah. Now, I don't think that they'll say, here's a blank check, yeah. fill it out, and we're good with it, but I think they're going to be more aggressive in trying to re-sign him than they probably expected at the beginning of the year. Yeah, and the other piece worth noting as it relates to Jansen is he's in the um, unfortunate situation of, he is he is a place on the roster where the Dodgers actually do have a decent amount of depth. Now, if if the Castillo yeah. report is true that that Joe Kelly is going to be bought out, he says they're going to try and negotiate some sort of a contract with him, but they're not going to pay him the twelve million dollars. The Dodgers still have Blake Trinan under contract. Tommy Canley is coming back. Corey Knebel is another free agent who who is leaving this season or potentially leaving is not under contract for next year. But you've got Trinan, you've got Canley, you've got. Um, Brock Stewart, who will be back, or yeah, uh, excuse me, Caleb Ferguson. Bruzdar. Caleb Ferguson, who's back at some point. Bruzdar Gratterall, who's who's a back end guy. Alex Vesia, Phil Bickford. Um, they've got all of these guys. Evan Phillips, who who pitched well. Um, you know, so I, I think bullpen is the one unique place where if we're talking about, hey, we need to figure out, we need to be wise with our money. The bullpen seems to be the easiest place to say, are we really going to spend the money it takes to get Kenley Jansen when we could allocate that money and go get. A Joe Kelly for seven million dollars a year for the next three years, or some equivalent player like that, versus what Jansen's going to get. Which leads me to the comps. If you're looking at some of the elite closers, Liam Hendricks, who was 31 at the time, so three years younger, a year ago, he got 18 million dollars a year for three years. Craig Kimbrell, as a 31 year old in 2019, he got about 14 million dollars a year. Andrew Miller, the closest age wise, he got about 12 and a half million dollars a year. I think Jansen gets the Hendricks number of 18 a year, I think just on a shorter deal. I wonder if it's a two-year contract at that number. I'm not sure if he's going to get three. Um, Russell Iglesias of the Angels is the other um, elite relief pitcher that's on the market. Many people have him actually ranked ahead of Jansen just from strictly a mileage on the arm perspective. But do you agree? Like if you're the Dodgers, you just came off a season where you had the best bullpen in franchise history, but Kelly might be gone. Jansen might be gone. Knable might be gone. And yet, I think, I wonder if the Dodgers say, we can piece together a bullpen, let's invest our resources in our position players where there's massive holes, or our starting rotation where there's massive holes as well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, honestly, I wouldn't expect them to go above, you know, maybe a 14 million average uh, on on Kenley's contract, and probably not past two years. And I think some of that, like you said, they have Blake Trinan already. So, I mean, he, if Blake Trinan was a closer, he could be one of the best closers yeah, in baseball. Yeah, he had better numbers than Kenley this year. So I think the, they'll easily, you know, it's not like if you don't re-sign Kenley now, you're scr- going to be scrambling for a closer. Yeah. Uh, they'll just anoint Trenin that role, and then you'll have what we saw this year, where just an array of setup men that they can kind of rotate and use however they yeah. need. Yeah, and that's the other piece. I think Jansen has this rigidity of, I'm the closer, and we know that the way baseball is going is they don't like that. They don't love the just like defined roles. They want guys that can come in in different spots. And so I think if Jansen leaves, there's a more flexible situation. Trinan would be the de facto end of game guy. But if you need him in the eighth inning for the for the heart of the lineup, he's clearly comfortable with that. So as we look at these five, Matt, we've got those five. We've got Seeger, We've got Scherzer. We've got Kershaw. We've got Jansen. We've got Taylor. Let me ask you a couple sort of rapid fire questions here. Who is who would be your top priority of those five? I'm, I'm not saying like who gets the most money. I'm not saying who's the most valuable even. But if if who would be your top priority of those five to go and get and why? My top priority would be Scherzer, and I think it's just because the Dodgers. You know, Walker Buehler is definitely a frontline starter, but we've 
we've seen, we just saw it in the playoffs. You, you need as much starting pitching as yeah. you can get. And I do subscribe to the theory as although the Dodgers were let down by their offenses, you know, starting pitching does sort of win you games. And I think especially in the postseason, if you have dominant starters who can keep the, the other offense at bay, it just obviously further uh, helps your offense at your own offenses cause. So for me, Scherzer would be the top priority. For me, I agree. I mean, I like Scherzer, obviously. <laughs> like To say one guy is number one does not mean you don't like any of the other. For me, the top priority right. would have to be Kershaw. I'll say this with my heart more than I'll say it with my head. I don't know how good Kershaw is going to be for the next three years. I don't know if he's fully healthy. But the idea of Clayton Kershaw's last moment as a Dodger being that one in, in Los Angeles against the Brewers on October 1st, the idea of Clayton Kershaw going and putting on somebody else's jersey, I couldn't live with it. So if he retires, I would hate it but it would be better than him playing for someone else. So for me, priority number one would be Clayton Kershaw. Now, if we go the opposite question, I'll answer this one first. Last priority, I kind of already laid out the case, but it would be Kenley Jansen. It's not because I don't value Kenley Jansen. As I've joked before, I got one bold prediction right in 2021, and that was that Kenley <laughs> Jansen was going to be amazing. I think I said sub-3 ERA and got laughed at for it. He went 2.22, so shout out to that. But I just think the, the depth of bullpen um, arms that the Dodgers have I just think makes it, I, I would rather allocate those resources differently. So for me, of these five, Jansen would be fifth on my priority list. Who do you have number five, lowest priority? I'm inclined to agree with you, but for the sake of the show and trying to add a little bit of variety, I'll say it, it for me, honestly, it's a little bit of a toss up and a little bit of a hot take because it could be Corey okay. Seager. And I think the reason is like we touched on earlier in the show is you have Trey Turner there, there ready to kind of slide. Trey Turner probably wants to play yeah. shortstop next year, right? That, that would be my guess. So if for whatever reason, so because of that, similar to the Kenley case where you have a clear replacement already within the organization, obviously if you don't re-sign Corey Seager, then it just puts you under a little bit more duress with Trey Turner next year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it as a toss up between Corey Seager and Kenley Jansen as kind of the least, uh, prioritize free, free agent. And that's for why for me, you can't leave this off season with none of the shortstop guys signing with you and with Trey Turner, not extended. Like if, if Seager, if, if Seager decides to go elsewhere, I think you can play hardball with Corey Seager and you can say, Hey, here's our offer. It, it this offer is good for five days and, and think it over. You know, it's going to be a fair offer. We're going to make you a reasonable offer. Like I said, eight, two sixty, eight, two eighty, somewhere in that ballpark and say, it's a reasonable offer. But if you don't take this, then we're going to see how the market plays out. And we're going to wait for the Yank Yankees to sign whoever they're going to sign. And we're going to wait for the next guy to sign. And then whether it's Sori or whether it's Seager, whoever the third guy that's left is, we'll come back to that person and say, hey, you know what? We're kind of the only people standing around here left with $260 million <laughs> still in our pockets. And so our number is not going up. It might have actually come down a little bit. And oh, by the way, we have Trey Turner and he's our backup plan. Like he, he, who's a good backup plan, by the way. I would prefer Trey Turner to Corey Seager, which is a whole nother conversation. So I, I think that's how the Dodgers play it. Um, and not to mention they have Chris Taylor too. So it's like, look, if, if you were to sign Chris Taylor to a four-year deal and you were to let Seager walk and eventually lose Trey Turner, it would suck really, really badly. And you would have to be making some unbelievable moves around it. But at least you know you've got a guy who's a competent hitter and a competent fielder playing shortstop, the most important position on the infield, for the next three or four years. Then you wait for a Jacob Amaya to see if he develops. Gavin Lux, can he ever figure it out and actually play shortstop? Or is he destined for second base? I actually think, side note, hot take, I think Gavin Lux is like 12 months away from being Chris Taylor 2.0. I just think the athleticism, nobody believed it when Cody Bellinger yeah. went out to center field either. So I just think you give that guy an offseason to learn how to play center field, to learn how to play left field. I think the offense is going to be there, but he's going to be a guy that is going to be Chris Taylor 2.0. So anyways, I agree with you. Let me ask you one last question here. Then we'll get to a good user submitted question. Make a prediction for me on who comes back. Of these five guys, you could say all five of them resign. You could say none of them resign. You could say anything in between. Which of these five, if any, do you envision wearing Dodger blue in 2022? I think Kershaw, Taylor, and Jansen are re-signed. Okay. okay, and I'm going Kershaw, Taylor, and Max Scherzer. I think the Dodgers prioritize starting pitching. I think they saw what they just saw. They like the Scherzer timeline. I think it lines up with the Bobby Miller timeline and the Ryan Pepio timeline and all those guys. I think say, get this elite guy in here for two years, Kershaw for two years. Give the young guys, A, somebody to learn from, somebody to watch in spring training, but also time to just develop and, and sort of, you know, bake in the oven, if you will. 
and then we'll go from there. I think Chris Taylor is the cheaper alternative to Corey Seager. And uh, my side note is I think they extend Trey Turner before the uh, 2022 season begins. One question here. This is from Eric on Twitter. This is a great question, something I hadn't thought about. He says, I think Seager walks, but I wonder if the Dodgers will make a move for Chris Bryant. Now, again, we have we have not gotten to the show where we talk about outside free agents, but we, he says Bryant will probably be cheaper than Corey. I agree with that. I think you agree with that as well. Yeah. And has yep. the versatility the Dodgers like of being an infielder and an outfielder. What do you think? So first of all, we both envision Corey Seager long-term as a third baseman. So we're look we're in Chris Bryant. You're, you're getting a third baseman and paying him third baseman money, which is nice rather than getting a third baseman, but paying him shortstop money. And Bryant's been good over the last three seasons. He was really bad in 2020, but even with that, he's hit 60 home runs. He's got an 845 OPS, a 123 weighted runs created, negative four defensive runs saved at third base. So not great, but again, he could play third, he could play left, he could play center if Justin Turner's your part time DH, et cetera. It's not going to be cheap for Chris Bryant, but it's going to be cheaper, maybe $10 million less per year. But what do you think about Chris Bryant as a cheaper alternative to Corey Seeger? <laughs> I like it. I think I, Chris Bryant is somebody who I, I like. And I, th- I, you know, he obviously struggled last year. And when there was uh, at the trade deadline this year, uh, there was speculation that the Dodgers and Cubs were kind of talking and that maybe, you know, negotiations could grow to include Chris Bryant. I was definitely all for that. Uh, I, I guess to answer that question from the viewer or one of our followers specifically, I think it wouldn't necessarily be, though, a Chris Bryant for Corey Seager. I think it would be you don't re-sign Chris mm-hmm. Taylor and Corey Seager, and you f- use that money to then sign Chris Bryant. Okay. Yeah. It- do you still do? I, I Honestly, I might still do that because then, like you, then it kind of ties back into your point earlier. You then just go to Trey Turner and try to lock him up now to avoid yeah. any you know concerns next year. And Now you have Trey Turner at shortstop. You have Chris Bryant sort of filling a similar role of Chris Taylor where he could play left field. He could play center field. He can also play third base. Uh, And then once Justin Turner is ready to, you know, retire and move on to that phase of his life, then you have your clear cut everyday third baseman. Yeah. Yeah, It's an interesting one. Like I said, it wasn't one that I had considered. I think the numbers are are good and better than I would have expected. Um, Again, 845 OPS over the last three seasons is really good. 20 home runs a year. And that's not 60 home runs. I'll say that because to say 20 home runs a year include the 60 game (laughs) season is fairly unfair. Um, You know, again, not an elite defensive third baseman, but a competent one. And if we're talking about potential universal DH, Justin Turner being the primary guy there, well, Bryant can play some third base. When Turner comes in, Bryant could give somebody a day off in left field. He could move, give Bellinger a day off in center field. Bellinger could play first. Muncy could play second. I mean, you could rotate guys. They've got some positional versatility to cover some holes. And again, if you have, 10 guys that can play a bunch of different positions, it makes it a lot easier to cover for injuries, which we saw impact the Dodgers this postseason. So lots of... uh, And, you know, another... Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Another another wrinkle, I think, to this, too, is do the Dodgers look into trading A.J. Pollock? You know, he's coming... He he obviously... He carried the team during the regular season. There's no denying that. But is his value ever going to be higher? Probably not. So then if you can clear up more space, both financially and playing time for Chris Bryant by trading Pollock in a separate deal, that might make sense. Yeah. And Pollock on a team, very team friendly deal. So not only would a team be getting a one year rental of a guy who is healthy and coming off of, you know, one of his best seasons of his career, but I believe he's only making $15 million a year, which is well below, obviously his market value. He's got a player option next year. He will almost assuredly be opting out of. And so, um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's funny because we talk about all the holes the Dodgers have. It's hard to imagine them trading a guy like A.J. Pollock. But I've kind of wondered the same thing of if you're going to trade someone, obviously it's not going to be Mookie. It's not going to be Cody Bellinger. At least we don't think. There was some speculation. I think the postseason uh, closed the door on on that. Um, <laughs> and, and you've got, you know, left field. Like, do you, do you trust a guy like Gavin Lux out there? Do you want Chris Taylor to be your everyday left fielder? Um, definitely interesting to see how that shakes out. I think they've got enough holes, but who knows? I mean, could they trade Trey Turner if they re-sign Corey Seager to a long-term contract? Do they recoup some assets for Trey Turner, take his $20 million off the books, and then allocate that somewhere else? I mean, there's lots of lots of creative things. And, and look, we know with the Dodgers, it's expect the unexpected. None of us expected Trevor Bauer a year ago, and then there we were. Uh, we, we all expected Justin Turner, and then we didn't expect Justin Turner, and then we expected him again, and he signed. <laughs> and so lots of fun stuff coming up. Of course, DodgerBlue.com, DodgerBlue 1958. We'll have everything for you. If you're here watching on YouTube, thank you. Please subscribe, 
ring the notification bell. As Matt said, we've got a video up talking about Corey Seager and some news that that sort of broke about him getting offered a contract extension. Daniel and I talk. Was that before the Trey Turner trade? Was it after? How do those two things play out? We've got a video coming this week on Joe Kelly and the decision that's being made on there and whether or not the Dodgers would look to extend him long term. So tons and tons of content coming. Um, we appreciate you as always. Um, that's Matt Moreno. My name's Jeff Spiegel. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your night whenever you're watching this. As we as we can, we will continue ending the show with the words of Vince Gilly. Have a good one. The best team holding a trophy high in the air. The Los Angeles Dodgers, champions of the baseball world.